And now in intermediate accounting class, we're ready to start looking in more detail at some of the things we looked at in Accounting 211 and Accounting 212. Review's over. So first we're going to take a, a, a harder look at the classified balance sheet. So the classified balance sheet has um, current assets listed first, investments, those are not current assets, property, plant, and equipment, intangibles, and then other assets. And all these together are added to come up with total assets. Well, on liabilities and equity side, of course, we break out liabilities separately from equity. We have um, current liabilities and long-term liabilities that make up total liabilities. And then we have paid-in capital and retained earnings adding up to total equity. And of course, total assets on the left are identical to total liabilities and equity on the right, so those amounts must agree. Now, what you're going to see soon is that by doing this classified balance sheet, we're going to be able to do ratio analysis that we really could not do if we hadn't broken the assets or the liabilities into current and long-term portions. Well, another big thing we do in intermediate accounting, and indeed we do in real life, is we are going to have to start looking at disclosures at the back of the financial statements. So a lot of times the financial statements don't say enough and we actually have to provide additional disclosures so that users of the statements can fully understand them. So common disclosure, very often the very first disclosure, is what we'll call the summary of significant accounting policies. And, um, you know, we're not saying that different companies can break the rules. We're saying that sometimes um, different companies um, interpret the rules differently, but in all cases are following the rules. So, for example, the summary of significant accounting policies might tell you how a company accounts for inventory, might tell you when it writes off accounts receivable. Um, also, the summary of accounting policies will often tell you when revenue is recognized. Uh, for example, um, if there's a sale, is the revenue recognized um, as soon as the contract is made? And there's a lot, you know, there's a liability by the other party, or is the revenue recognized when the work is done? Now, if you think about this, it would not follow um, generally accepted accounting principles to record the revenue when there was a liability, but work hadn't been done. However, the summary of significant uh, accounting policies might explain that um, it for this particular business, um, almost as soon as the contract is executed, the work is done. And it's easier to go ahead and record the revenue um, using the, the, the sale. Um, the su summary of significant accounting policies in this case would often go on to say that at the end of the year, they're very quick to um, reverse any revenue that they've learned shouldn't have been recognized. Uh, a, a common disclosure that's required in all cases is subsequent events. A company might not have any. But a subsequent event is something that occurs after the financial statement date. So that date is often December 31st, but before issuance. So a very common arrangement is a company might issue financial statements on March 20th, and the statements have a date of December 31st. So anything that happened between um, December 31st and March 20th um, that's significant would be disclosed in a subsequent event. Remember, it's going to take a little time to prepare the financial statements, and that's why even if December 31st is the financial statement date, there's going to be some lapse of time before the statement's issued. Related parties. So this is a big disclosure, and it's going to be very different for different parties. Uh, you have a blog coming up dealing with this topic, but here we're going to talk about whether the company president, um, other key officers have separate companies that do business with the company. Here's just one example. You might find that um, the Connor company is owned by Bill Connor. And then Bill Connor also has um, Bill's Investments, and Bill's Investments owns the building that Connor operates in. So if Bill's Investments is, is charging the Connor Corporation a lease to use its building, um, we'll disclose the terms of the lease 
in the related parties note. Management discussion and analysis is where management talks. And um, so usually every year in every company, there'll be a management discussion and analysis section, and it'll discuss things like cash flows. It'll discuss um, why dividends were paid if they were paid, why they weren't paid if they weren't. It'll assess performance. Uh, I would say that um, management discussion and analysis is usually a little more exciting if the year looks bad um, in the financial statements and management's trying to justify it um, in the management um, discussion and analysis. There will usually be a disclosure about the compensation of officers. Um, you've, all of us have heard about the um, astronomical um, amount of executive pay these days, and so shareholders are usually very interested in whether um, the company's doing bad, but the officers are compensated great. So this footnote will tell you, um, because otherwise you wouldn't see it in salary expense. That's got everybody's salaries in there together. But compensation of officers will tell you how much the president makes, how much the vice president makes. Uh, if some of their compensation is based in shares of stock or stock options instead of cash. Um, we're going to revisit ratios in Chapter 3. Remember, our classified balance sheet allows us to do a current ratio where we have current assets divided by current liabilities. It also allows us to do an acid test ratio where we start with current assets, back off inventory, and back off prepaids, and divide that by current liabilities. So I usually tell students that, <coughs> excuse me, if a company has inventory, I don't want them to do the current ratio. I want them to do the acid test. I want to see if even after inventory is backed out, there are enough other current assets to pay current liabilities. Let me rephrase this. If a company doesn't have enough um, current assets to pay off its current liabilities, unless it sells its inventory, I'm afraid that we're not talking about the normal course of business. I'm afraid we're talking about selling the inventory at a fire sale and taking a remarkably low price just to pay the bills. <coughs> Uh, the debt to equity ratio, I didn't write the title and write the ratio itself because the ratio is the title, um, debt divided by equity. And there's no good rule of thumb here. Um, a lot of times mature companies will have low debt and high equity, but it, a lot of it depends on the type of business you're in. Uh, these slides are out of order. Uh, this goes back to some disclosures. Um, no, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's in order. The, the, slide, the slide's titled wrong. It should have also been titled ratios. Because here we have the return on stockholders' equity, and it's a ratio showing net income divided by common equity, and the times interest earned ratio. And IBIT, IBIT is a common finance term. It's a common finance acronym, and it stands for Earnings Before Interest and Taxes. So here you have earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. This is usually trying to figure out um, how much revenue the interest expense generates. Is it good to have the loans? That's what, that's what we're determining here. We'll wrap up chapter three by thinking about the auditor's report. So uh, not all companies are required to have audited financial statements, but all companies traded on a stock exchange are required to have audited financial statements. So there's four basic financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, statement of cash flows, and statement of retained earnings or statement of uh, stockholders' equity are required to be audited if the company is traded on a stock exchange. Also many times, um, if the company's borrowed a lot of money from a bank, then the bank will require an audit. So if a CPA firm which would be the type of organization that would do an audit of the company's financial statements. If the CPA firm audits the financial statements, the firm can give three types of opinion. It could give an unqualified opinion, which is the only good one. That means we're unqualified. This is a, this is a great statement. I mean, we're not saying that it is great and the company's a good investment. We're saying that what you see is what you get. An adverse opinion says this is lousy. Um, this is not transparent. The company um, has not done some things that they should have done according to generally accepted accounting principles, and we don't know if this financial statement's right or not. Disclaimer says um, the 
the financial statements are right except for one big thing. Um, for example, one of the things that a company will often disclaim is if they um, were not engaged to do an audit at the, at the end of last year and the company has beginning inventory and there wasn't another firm, maybe there was no audit last year, this year there's an audit. Often there'll be a, a disclaimer on the financial statements because the auditor doesn't understand whether inventory is accurate or not. There was no count last year. Um, let me close with the audit implies that management produces the financial statements or the company produces the financial statements. So you might think of a chief financial officer or a treasurer or a controller um, preparing financial statements with the help of the accounting department. And then an outside CPA, somebody that doesn't work for the firm, actually comes in and takes a look and tries to determine if the financial statements look right or not. Well, this is um, the review of, or discussion of uh, balance sheet and disclosure items. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Take care.